The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen Part One Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep. So deep, indeed, that no cable could fathom it. Many church steeples piled one upon another would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwell the sea king and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed, the most singular flowers and plants grow there, the leaves and stems of which are so pliant that the slightest agitation of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes, both large and small, glide between the branches as birds fly among the trees here upon land. In the deepest spot of all stands the castle of the Sea King. Its walls are built of coral, and the long Gothic windows are of the clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells that open and close as the water flows over them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. The Sea King had been a widower for many years, and his aged mother kept house for him. She was a very wise woman, and exceedingly proud of her high birth. On that account she wore twelve oysters on her tail, while others, also of a high rank, were only allowed to wear six. She was, however, deserving of very great praise, especially for her care of the little sea princesses, her granddaughters. They were six beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose-leaf, and her eyes as blue as the deepest sea. But like all the others, she had no feet, and her body ended in a fish's tail. All day long they played in the great halls of the castle, or among the living flowers that grew out of the walls. The large amber windows were open, and the fish swam in, just as the swallows fly into our houses when we open the windows, excepting that the fishes swam up to the princesses, ate out of their hands, and allowed themselves to be stroked. Outside the castle there was a beautiful garden, in which grew bright red and dark blue flowers, and blossoms like flames of fire. The fruit glittered like gold and the leaves and stems waved to and fro continually. The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as the flame of burning sulphur. Over everything lay a peculiar blue radiance, as if it were surrounded by the air from above, through which the blue sky shone, instead of the dark depths of the sea. In calm weather the sun could be seen looking like a purple flower, with the light streaming from the calyx. Each of the young princesses had a little plot of ground in the garden where she might dig and plant as she pleased. One arranged her flower-bed into the form of a whale. Another thought it better to make hers like the figure of a little mermaid. But that of the youngest was round like the sun, and contained flowers as red as his rays at sunset. She was a strange child quiet and thoughtful, and while her sisters would be delighted with the wonderful things which they obtained from the wrecks of vessels, she cared for nothing but her pretty red flowers, like the sun, excepting a beautiful marble statue. It was the representation of a handsome boy, carved out of pure white stone which had fallen to the bottom of the sea from a wreck. She planted by the statue a rose-colored weeping willow. It grew splendidly, and very soon hung its fresh branches over the statue, almost down to the blue sands. The shadow had a violet tint, and waved to and fro like the branches. It seemed as if the crown of the tree and the root were at play, and trying to kiss each other. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as to hear about the world above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her all she knew of the ships and of the towns, the people and the animals. To her it seemed most wonderful and beautiful 
to hear that the flowers of the land should have fragrance and not those below the sea that the trees of the forest should be green and that the fishes among the trees could sing so sweetly that it was quite a pleasure to hear them her grandmother called the little birds fishes or she would not have understood her for she had never seen birds when you have reached your fifteenth year said the grandmother you will have permission to rise up out of the sea to sit on the rocks in the moonlight while the great ships are sailing by and then you will see both forests and towns in the following year one of the sisters would be fifteen but as each was a year younger than the other the youngest would have to wait five years before her turn came to rise up from the bottom of the ocean and see the earth as we do however each promised to tell the others what she saw on her first visit and what she thought the most beautiful for their grandmother could not tell them enough there were so many things on which they wanted information none of them longed so much for her turn to come as the youngest she who had the longest time to wait and who was so quiet and thoughtful many nights she stood by the open window looking up through the dark blue water and watching the fish as they splashed about with their fins and tails she could see the moon and stars shining faintly but through the water they looked larger than they do to our eyes when something like a black cloud passed between her and them she knew that it was either a whale swimming over her head or a ship full of human beings who never imagined that a pretty little mermaid was standing beneath them holding out her white hands towards the keel of their ship as soon as the eldest was fifteen she was allowed to rise to the surface of the ocean when she came back she had hundreds of things to talk about but the most beautiful she said was to lie in the moonlight on a sandbank in the quiet sea near the coast and to gaze on a large town nearby where the lights were twinkling like hundreds of stars to listen to the sounds of the music the noise of the carriages and the voices of human beings and then to hear the merry bells peal out from the church steeples and because she could not go near to all those wonderful things she longed for them more than ever oh did not the youngest sister listen eagerly to all these descriptions and afterwards when she stood at the open window looking up through the dark blue water she thought of the great city with all its bustle and noise and even fancied she could hear the sound of the church bells down in the depths of the sea in another year the second sister received permission to rise to the surface of the water and to swim about where she pleased she rose just as the sun was setting and this she said was the most beautiful sight of all the whole sky looked like gold while violet and rose-colored clouds which she could not describe floated over her and still more rapidly than the clouds flew a large flock of wild swans toward the setting sun looking like a long white veil across the sea she also swam toward the sun but it sunk into the waves and the rosy tints faded from the clouds and from the sea the third sister's turn followed she was the boldest of them all and she swam up a broad river that emptied itself into the sea on the banks she saw green hills covered with beautiful vines palaces and castles peeped out from amid the proud trees of the forest she heard the birds singing and the rays of the sun were so powerful that she was obliged often to dive down under the water to cool her burning face in a narrow creek she found a whole troop of little human children quite naked and sporting about in the water she wanted to play with them but they fled in a great fright and then a little black animal came to the water it was a dog but she did not know that for she had never before seen one this animal barked at her so terribly that she became frightened and rushed back to the open sea but she said she should never forget the beautiful forest the green hills and the pretty little children who could swim in the water although they had not 
fishes' tails. The fourth sister was more timid. She remained in the midst of the sea, but she said it was quite as beautiful there as nearer the land. She could see for many miles around her, and the sky above looked like a bell of glass. She had seen the ships, but at such a great distance that they looked like seagulls. The dolphins sported in the waves, and the great whales spouted water from their nostrils till it seemed as if a hundred fountains were playing in every direction. The fifth sister's birthday occurred in the winter, so when her turn came she saw what the others had not seen the first time they went up. The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each like a pearl, she said, but larger and loftier than the churches built by men. They were of the most singular shapes, and glittered like diamonds. She had seated herself upon one of the largest, and let the wind play with her long hair, and she remarked that all the ships sailed by rapidly, and steered as far away as they could from the iceberg, as if they were afraid of it. Towards evening, as the sun went down, dark clouds covered the sky. The thunder rolled, and the lightning flashed, and the red light glowed on the icebergs as they rocked and tossed on the heaving sea. On all the ships the sails were reefed with fear and trembling. While she sat calmly on the floating iceberg, watching the blue lightning as it darted its forked flashes into the sea. When first the sisters had permission to rise to the surface, they were each delighted with the new and beautiful sights they saw. But now, as grown-up girls, they could go when they pleased, and they had become indifferent about it. They wished themselves back again in the water, and after a month had passed, they said it was much more beautiful down below, and pleasanter to be at home. Yet often, in the evening hours, the five sisters would twine their arms round each other, and rise to the surface in a row. They had more beautiful voices than any human being could have, and before the approach of a storm, and when they expected a ship would be lost, they swam before the vessel and sang sweetly of the delights to be found in the depths of the sea, and begging the sailors not to fear if they sank to the bottom. But the sailors could not understand the song. They took it for the howling of the storm, and these things were never to be beautiful for them, for if the ship sank, the men were drowned, and their dead bodies alone reached the palace of the Sea King. When the sisters rose arm in arm through the waters in this way, their youngest sister would stand quite alone, looking after them, ready to cry, only that the mermaids have no tears, and therefore they suffer more. Oh, were I but fifteen years old, said she, I know that I shall love the world up there and all the people who live in it. At last she reached her fifteenth year. Well, now you are grown up, said the old dowager, her grandmother, so you must let me adorn you like your other sisters. And she placed a wreath of white lilies in her hair, and every flower leaf was half a pearl. Then the old lady ordered eight great oysters to attach themselves to the tail of the princess to show her high rank. But they hurt me so, said the little mermaid. Pride must suffer pain, replied the old lady. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all this grandeur and laid aside the heavy wreath. The red flowers in her own garden would have suited her much better, but she could not help herself, so she said farewell and rose as lightly as a bubble to the surface of the water. The sun had just set as she raised her head above the waves, but the clouds were tinted with crimson and gold, and through the glimmering twilight beamed the evening star in all its beauty. The sea was calm, and the air mild and fresh. A large ship, with three masts, lay becalmed on the water, with only one sail set, for not a breeze stiffed, and the sailors sat idle on deck or amongst the rigging. There was music and song on board, and as darkness came on, a hundred colored lanterns were lighted, as if the flags of all nations waved in the air. The little mermaid swam close to the cabin windows, and now and then, as the waves lifted her up, she could look in through the clear glass window panes 
and see a number of well-dressed people within among them was a young prince the most beautiful of all with large black eyes he was sixteen years of age and his birthday was being kept with much rejoicing the sailors were dancing on deck but when the prince came out of the cabin more than a hundred rockets rose in the air making it as bright as day the little mermaid was so startled that she dived under water and when she again stretched out her head it appeared as if all the stars of heaven were falling around her she had never seen such fireworks before great suns spurted fire about splendid fireflies flew into the blue air and everything was reflected in the clear calm sea beneath the ship itself was so brightly illuminated that all the people and even the smallest rope could be distinctly and plainly seen and how handsome the young prince looked as he pressed the hands of all present and smiled at them while the music resounded through the clear night air it was very late yet the little mermaid could not take her eyes from the ship or from the beautiful prince the colored lanterns had been extinguished no more rockets rose in the air and the cannon had ceased firing but the sea became restless and the moaning grumbling sound could be heard beneath the waves still the little mermaid remained by the cabin window rocking up and down on the water which enabled her to look in after a while the sails were quickly unfurled and the noble ship continued her passage but soon the waves rose higher heavy clouds darkened the sky and lightning appeared in the distance a dreadful storm was approaching once more the sails were reefed and the great ship pursued her flying course over the raging sea the waves rose mountains high as if they would have overtopped the mast but the ship dived like a swan between them and then rose again on their lofty foaming crests to the little mermaid this appeared pleasant sport not so to the sailors at length the ship groaned and creaked the thick planks gave way under the lashing of the sea as it broke over the deck the mainmast snapped asunder like a reed the ship lay over on her side and the water rushed in the little mermaid now perceived that the crew were in danger even she herself was obliged to be careful to avoid the beams and planks of the wreck which lay scattered on the water at one moment it was so pitch dark that she could not see a single object but a flash of lightning revealed the whole scene she could see every one who had been on board excepting the prince when the ship parted she had seen him sink into the deep waves and she was glad for she thought he would now be with her and then she remembered that human beings could not live in the water so that when he got down to her father's palace he would be quite dead but he must not die so she swam about among the beams and planks which strewed the surface of the sea forgetting that they could crush her to pieces and then she dived deeply under the dark waters rising and falling with the waves till at length she managed to reach the young prince who was fast losing the power of swimming in that stormy sea his limbs were failing him his beautiful eyes were closed and he would have died had not the little mermaid come to his assistance she held his head above the water and let the waves drift them where they would end of part one of the little mermaid